have your Bibles, turn with me to Exodus chapter 32. We have a message that we're going to preach to you this morning. Like I said, I have a little bit of an intro thought, and then I'm going to hand it over to him. He's the fireball. He's going to bring it home to you today. And the title of our message is, This Time, I'm Not Losing It. This time, I'm not losing it. If you turn with me to Exodus chapter 32, verses 2, we're going to read a couple of verses, and then we're going to jump off the main text here. And and just to kind of bring you up to speed, where we're at in this portion of Scripture, it's where um, Moses had a mighty transformation. They went to the Pharaoh. He had the ten plagues. There was deliverance that took place. The part of the Red Sea was mighty. It was miraculous. Um, God calls then after they cross the Jordan, after Pharaoh's uh, defeated, his armies was defeated, God calls them over to cross into the promised land. And here they are now where God calls Moses to go and meet with him up on the mountaintop. And this is what takes place while Moses goes up to meet with the Lord. If you read with me in verse 2, Aaron says this. So Aaron's in charge. and He says, he says to them this, take off the gold earrings that, you're, that your wives and your sons and your daughters are wearing and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. He took what he handed them and made them into an idol cast in the shape of a calf, fastening it with a tool. Then they said, these are your gods, Israel, whom brought you out of Egypt. Hmm, interesting. Now skip down to verse 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I have commanded them, and they have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it and sacrificed it and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Now skip again to verse 15. Moses turned and went down the mountain with the two tablets of the covenant of law in his hand. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. This is the Ten Commandments that the Lord had gave to him. The tablets were the work of God, the writing on the, of the hand of God engraved on the tablets. And then when, Mo- when Joshua heard the sound of people shouting, he said to Moses, There is a sound of war in the camp. And Moses replied, This is not the sound of victory. It is not the sound of defeat. It is the sound of singing that I hear. And when Moses approached the the camp and he saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. Now skip one more time to me. Verse chapter 34, verse 1, chapter 34, just one page over. It says this, then the Lord says to Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones, and I will write on them the words that were, were on the first tablet which you broke. Let's pray for a moment. Lord, we just thank you, God, for this time together. We pray, Lord God, that you will speak to every heart here today, Lord God. We thank you, God, that what you're doing in the lives of Greater Bridgeport, we thank you for what you're doing in the leadership. God, we pray for Pastor and his wife, Magdalia. God, we pray a blessing upon them today, Lord Jesus. We pray that you'll give us ears to hear, Lord God, and eyes to see. We pray, Lord, that you will open up our hearts to receive that this time, God, this time we're not going to lose it. In Jesus' name, We thank you for it. Amen. Well, you know, I, I'm so thankful to be here this morning. It's, a, it's just such a great thing to see the faces of all the people here. We feel like we're home. And as I, I, I am home, that's right. And as I look through the book of Exodus, we think about what Exodus really means. It's a book of motion, movement, momentum in the right direction. Come on, somebody. In fact, the word Exodus means to exit or to depart. How many times that we are thankful that God brings us out and doesn't keep us in, that God is a God of exodus, that God is a God of movement, motion, momentum. How many are thankful that God doesn't keep us stuck where we're at? Amen? We don't don't serve a God that keeps us in. We serve a God that brings us out. As we've seen in the the text with Moses, God is a God of an exodus God, an exit moving God, a momentum God, a a, a movement, God. So, you know, when we read about this, we see, look at 
And the book of Exodus reminds us who God is, what he's all about. We're reminded that God has an excellent exit strategy for us. Sometimes we think that we're in the middle of a situation, and we think that we're in it all by ourselves, and it must have took God by surprise what we're going through. But no, no, I'm here to remind you this morning that God has a great exit strategy for you this morning. And I'm not talking about geographically. I'm talking about spiritually. I'm talking about in our hearts and our, mi- our, our minds and our mentality that God has a way to bring us out because he's not about keeping us in. It's about bringing us out. Not only is the book of Exodus about exit and departure, but it's also about freedom. Let me bring it a little step further. It's not only about freedom, but it's also about deliverance. You see, God is not just interested in your freedom. Come on, somebody. You guys are quiet. God is not just interested in your freedom. He's interested in your deliverance. How many know that you can be free from something but not delivered from it? Take a moment to think about that. You can be free from something but not delivered from it. You see, the Israelites were freed from Egypt, but their deliverance was getting Egypt out of the Israelites. They had that same mentality, those same behaviors, those same attitudes as before. How can I say that? Why? Because the first thing that they did when God brought them out, when God saved them, when God set them free, what did they do? They just set up a calf and said, this is your God, Israel. Come on, somebody. That, that's, not, that's, not who that, that's not who brought them out of Egypt. That's not who God, God brought out of Egypt. You see... What I've learned in the 20 years at TC, and I've been, I came to Teen Challenge in 1999 as an intern straight from Bible college, felt the ministry and call of, of God in my life and fell in, in love with the ministry. I remember one day at Teen Challenge, um, I, I did, I fell in love with the ministry and then I fell in love with my husband. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I remember, I remember one day coming in Teen Challenge and, you know, the brokenness and the heart, the heartache of people that are going through different struggles in their life. And I remember praying with young people up in their beds as their tears are streaming down their face of the brokenness of addiction. And one of the things that I have learned and we have learned over the 20 years of being at Teen Challenge that as long as you can get away with something, you will never be delivered from it. As long as you can get away with it. You're never going to get delivered from it. You know, see, there's people who've been freed from Egypt, set free from drugs and alcohol, but the deliverance on getting Egypt out of them is still needs to be there. You know what I'm saying? In other words, they're off drugs, but they're still acting crazy at home. They're off drugs, but they're still acting crazy when the wrong people are around. They're still manipulating and controlling and acting all, all you know what I'm saying. You guys are getting all dignified on me. Come on, somebody. You see, they need to get that deliverance, not just free from drugs and alcohol. It's that deliverance from that whole mentality. Come on, that Egypt mentality. You know, if God has set you free, and I believe he has, there's many people in the sound of my voice. If God has set you free, and you've not only encountered freedom, but you've also encountered deliverance. Can we just give God a crazy praise? Can we just give God a crazy praise? I don't know about you, but this time I'm not losing it. This time I'm not losing it. You see, it's more than about being freed. It's about being delivered. This time I'm giving God my highest praise because I know what he brought me out of. And I'm excited what he's bringing me into. Come on, somebody shout, somebody shout Exodus. Come on, Exodus, come on. This time I'm not losing it. Friends, there are times in life where we do lose things, are there not? Are there times and season in life where we end up where we lose things, things that are hard to go through, difficult moments, things aren't always easy. Come on, think we go through things. Sometimes in our lives we lose things. I'm sure there's some out there today that have gone through seasons of loss, that it's been difficult. In my, in because of, now sometimes it's because of my own doing and sometimes it's not. My own mistakes, my own decisions, but now we really receive And we realize that God is a God of second, third, fourth chances. This time, we're not going to lose it. This time, we're not going to lose it. You know, and as I was, of course, thinking of this scripture and as this text, I was thinking about a, a lot of different Bible characters that have experienced this loss. Of course, Moses was one. He experienced lots of losses in his life. And he could come to this place and say, this time, I'm not going to lose it. But I also think about Ruth. Ruth was a powerful 
uh, Bible character, when you think about what God did in Ruth's life, and I'm just going to read you a little portion of scripture just to kind of parallel this text with Moses and with Ruth, just to kind of give you an idea of what um, the Lord had been ministered to me. And it was coming out of Ruth chapter 2, verses 17. A little uh, snippet of scripture, and I'm going to read it to you. It says this. So Ruth gleaned into the field. They're talking about Boaz here. Ruth gleaned in the field until evening, and she threshed the barley and gathered, and it had been the amount of an ephah. She carried it back to town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gathered. Ruth also brought out and gave enough what she had left over to be eaten for by her, brother, her mother-in-law. Her mother-in-law asked her, where did you glean today, and where did you work? Blessed be the man who, take, who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one who had the place that she had been working and whose name was Boaz. Then, then this is what Naomi says to her. The Lord bless him. He has not stopped showing kindness and loving kindness to the dead. She said, this man is our close relative. He is the guardian, our kinsman, redeemer. And then, and then she says this. Um, then Ruth said to Moabite, he has even said to me, stay with my workers until they had finished harvesting all the grain. Now, this is the key verse in verse 22. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it would be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work with him because, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. Because in someone else's field you might be harmed. You know, that really ministered to me, and we'll get into that in a, sec in a second here, but... A kinsman redeemer, I don't know if any of you have done that study, is, is a typology of Christ. That's why this is included in, in the canon, in the books of the Bible, because the Boaz is considered the kinsman redeemer. He is the one that came back and um, married Ruth. And, of course, you know the genealogy and the lineage of, of Jesus, came, Jesus came out of um, that, that relationship. And it says this, the kinsman redeemer is a typology of Christ, a beautiful symbolism of Jesus who redeemed the bride for himself, the church. Now, while Ruth was disgraced as her position as a widow and despised for her ethnicity as a Moabite and hum humbled and left empty handed, Boaz, her kinsman redeemer, treats her with loving kindness. Isn't that the same way that Jesus does to us? Disgraced by our sin, despised and humbly and humbled and completely left empty handed. We have nothing to offer God, but he what this is what he does. He treats us with his loving kindness. But here's what I really want to share with you, and this is how it relates to this time. I'm not going to lose it. You see, in verse 20, it says, 22, it says, It will be good for you, my daughter, to go work with the women who work with him, because in someone else's field you might be harmed. Can I just pause and state for a moment that when you serve and you glean in someone else's field other than the kinsman redeemer, you're going to get hurt? When we people please and we look for our worth in anyone other's field than our kinsman redeemer, we're going to get harmed. When we look for people to affirm the call of God that has been placed on our life, church, we're going to end up getting hurt. Why? Because there is no love like the love of God. When we care too much about what people think, we're gleaning in the wrong field. Come on, somebody. When we're so consumed about what people think, what people say, what people do, listen, we're gleaning in the wrong field. Why? Because the Bible says we need to glean in the kinsman redeemer's field. Because any other field, I'm going to get hurt. Any other field, if I pursue it, I'm going to get hurt. Any other field, they're, they're going to mistreat me and treat me wrong, and they're going to they're gonna do things to me that I, they shouldn't do to me. Why? Because they're not my kinsman redeemer. Come on, somebody. They're only in the kinsman redeemer's field, only in his field, only in his will I find that fullness and that grace and that grain to feed not only myself, but that grain to feed my family. Come on, somebody. You see, in Christ, I have nothing to hide. Nothing to prove, nothing to fear, and nothing to lose. In Christ, I am free. You are free to be who God has called you to be. Like it or love it, take it or leave it. I was born to fulfill one man's purpose, and that is my kinsman redeemer. Come on, somebody. Listen, church, and I say this with a lovingly uh, 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 affirmation. Don't expect people to understand your hustle when God didn't give them your vision. Come on, somebody. Come on. Don't expect people to understand your hustle when God didn't give them your hustle. See, they weren't with you when God called you. 
They weren't with you and walking you through the steps that brought you to that place. They can look at you and judge you all you want. But you know what? I don't expect you to understand my hustle. Come on, Magdalia. I don't expect anybody to understand my hustle because God didn't give it to them. He gave it to me. You know, in fact, make sure everyone in your boat is rowing and not drilling holes when you're not looking. Come on, somebody. Come on. We got to have people. We got to have people like-minded, like-minded rowing with us. We have to get to a place that we wake up different. Done trying to figure out who is with you, who's against you, or who's walking down the middle because they can't take a stand. Done with anything or anyone who doesn't bring peace. Finally, realizing that opinions are a dime a dozen. And that loyalty isn't a catchphrase, but a lifestyle. And that validation is for parking at Yankee Stadium. Come on, somebody. You know, listen, listen. We have to get to the place where we start gleaning in the right field. This time, I'm not losing it. Come on. This time, I'm not losing it. Friends, if you're gleaning in anyone else's field, you're finding yourself in anyone other's field than the kinsman redeemer, it's time to find your worth, to find your comfort in his alone, in his place alone. Find your peace. Find your companionship. Find your wholeness. Find your purpose, your direction in kinsman redeemer's field. For Ruth, she understand what it was to love and to loss. Read her story. She understood what it was to love and to loss. And this time, it was different. This time, she wasn't going to lose it. This time, she wasn't going to drop what God had gave her. This time, the promise would be fulfilled, and generations after her would reap the benefits of her obedience. This time, she wasn't going to lose it. So with, it, with that being said, I'm going to hand it off to my Boaz. <laughs> and he's going to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Ruth. Thank you. She handed it over to her Boaz. Now look with me in our text. I want to talk to you a little bit about um, how Moses worked through this process. You know, Dr. Anna mentioned that Ruth was not losing her promise. And let me set it up. Let me set up this portion of scripture. Because Moses went up to Mount Sinai and he began sharing all these great and profound truths about himself. And then God said to him, God began to talk to him. God began to minister to him. God began to share all these great things and all these great truths about who he was. And God talked about the law, his covenant. And then the Bible says that God gave Moses tablet stones inscribed with his own very finger. Can I just state technically, Moses was the first person with a tablet. Can I get a witness? Amen. Yeah. Come on, yeah, 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 yeah. Not Apple, it was Moses, amen? Don't get it twisted. And he was the first one to download data from the cloud. Oh, that's good. Oh, that's good, yeah, that's good. That's worth Facebooking for those that are on phone right now, amen? Look at Exodus 32, verses 15 to 19, amen? Moses turns and went down the mountain with two tablets in covenant law in his hands. They were inscribed on both sides, front and back. The tablets were the work of God. The writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Here's a takeaway. Every time Moses went into God's presence, he never left empty-handed. Just like Ruth and her kinsman redeemer. How many know here that when you are with God, he gives us more than we can ever give him? When we are with God, he will never leave you empty and he will never leave you empty. Amen? How many are ready for God to give you something this morning that you've been praying for? How many are ready for God to give you a miracle this morning? How many are ready, amen, for a breakthrough this name? Tell your neighbor, I'm not leaving here empty-handed. Go ahead, tell your neighbor that. That's right, we're not going to leave here empty-handed. The Bible states that God inscribed on both sides, front and back. How many know that our God works both sides? Of the equation. Front and back. Whatever you're going through, God has both sides covered. Tell your neighbor this morning, God's got my back. Go ahead. 
That's right. You're going to be talking to one another. I like that. God's got both sides of your problem. God's got both sides of your situation. God's got both sides of your circumstances. God's got both sides of your setback. Can somebody say amen? You may be seeing one side of the issue, but God sees both sides of the issue. You may have seen one side of handling things, but God sees both sides of handling things. God got both sides covered. God's got your back, and there's always two sides of the story. Hallelujah. Now in verse 17, the Bible says, when Moses heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there is a sound of war in the camp. And Moses, re Moses replied, it is not the sound of victory. Isn't it is not the sound of defeat. It is sound of singing that I hear. It was something out of the ordinary. There was not supposed to be singing there. I was going to get a word from heaven, and I'm coming down. And guess what his brother did? His brother took everybody's gold and threw it in the fire. And he said, no, no. He said, and he formed it as a calf. And he told Moses, when Moses came down and it was formed as a calf, he said, I threw everybody's gold and a calf popped out of the fire. Say what? Are you kidding me? Have you ever met somebody that gave you a lie that you know is ridiculous? <laughs> and you look at him and you say, you could have said something better than that, man. Come on. So what happened here? What happened here? Moses had a dramatic mountaintop experience with God. Moses had felt God's presence like none other. God gave him the Ten Commandments. The Bible states that the tablets were the work of God inscribed by the very finger of God. Can you just imagine the priceless artwork that Moses had in his hands? The priceless artwork, I mean, Picasso and Van Gogh or Leonardo da Vinci all have expensive price tags. But who can compare with the handwriting of God on the tablets that God created? And when you think that because of this amazing gift that God gave Moses, don't you think that he would have taken care of it with his very life? Oh, he's got precious tablets from heaven coming down the mountain, ready to proclaim all liberty and everything to all his people. I mean, what happened? Now, just the opposite, in epic human form, what did Moses do after coming down uh, out of a devotional time with God? Guess what he did? He lost it. He lost it. He lost it by smashing the tablets on the ground. How many here within the sound of my voice have lost it? Only three people. Oh, my gosh. Let me get, don't let me get in the spirit right now and call you right out. Amen. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. One time or another, you have lost it. Raise your hand. Let me see. Yeah, yeah, everybody's hand. Yeah. Like my wife said, don't get all dignified on me. Amen. I'll call you right out. How many here can testify that there has been times in your life that you've lost it? In fact, you lost it on the way to church. Can I get a witness? Amen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. With your husband or your wife or your children. Callate la boca. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You lost it. And with, and with that person that caught you off this morning, look at your neighbor and tell him don't lose it. Yeah, yeah. In other words, Moses got so angry. Moses got so angry over what he saw that he lost it. And he dropped what God gave him. Ooh, that's good. Listen, don't miss this. This is powerful. This is a powerful truth, and I, want you, I don't want you to miss this. There are times in our lives where God will allow us to see things, hear things, and witness things, negative things. Things that you don't want to see or hear about, but God allowed you to see them. Here's the lesson. Write this down. Don't let those things you've seen and heard discourage you and cause you to drop what God has given you. Oh, that's good stuff. That's good stuff. Oh, come on. That's deep. Don't let the things you've seen and heard cause you to drop what God has given you. Don't let the same things that you've seen and heard. And some of you, my friends, have seen some things. 
You've heard some things. People have hurt you. People have betrayed you. You've seen some things. Even some family members. Oh, can I get a witness here this morning? But don't let it distract you from what God has given you. Don't let what you've seen and heard derail you or defocus you of what God has given you today. Don't drop what God has given you. Tell your neighbor, I'm not going to drop it. Oh, come on, you can do better than that with an attitude. I'm not going to drop it. And snap your fingers. Yeah, I ain't going to drop it. That's right. Good English there. Yeah. How many people have been there before? You had an encounter with God. You're carrying your purpose in your hand. You're ready to tell the whole world what God has done, and boom, you drop it. You've seen things and you heard things that cause you to drop what God has given you. Amen? Maybe you dropped your calling or maybe you dropped your purpose or maybe you dropped your focus. Can I talk to some real people here this morning? Amen. I'm here to remind you this morning, don't let what you've seen or what you've heard, no matter how negative it is, cause you to drop what God has given you. God has given you purpose, and God has given you a plan, and God has given you a calling, and God has given you a gifting and destiny. God has given you big things for the future. Don't drop it. Don't drop it. Don't drop it. Tell your neighbor, I'm not dropping it. Yeah, that's right. We're not dropping it this morning. Here's another takeaway for those that are writing notes. Not only did Moses drop the tablets, but the Bible says that they were broken in pieces in the foot of the mountain. That's significant. Have you ever felt that way? Broken, shattered, cast down to pieces? You look over your life and you see broken dreams and broken relationships and broken lives. You feel the, the, the brokenness that has left you even useless here. Amen? You feel like you're beyond repair. You feel casted aside. You feel ashamed. You feel rejected. But friends, I have good news for you this morning. Amen. I'm just a mailman delivering the mail. Amen. It's up to you to sign it. Hallelujah. God brought me here this morning to remind you that God breaks through all that mess. How many people know that God can bless a mess? Oh, come on. You are never beyond healing, my friends. You're never too broken for restoration. You're never too shattered for repair. We serve a God of exodus. We serve the God of new beginnings, second chances. We serve a God who don't leave us in captivity, whose goal isn't just to bring us in, but to bring us out. Hallelujah. Oh, can I get a witness this morning? Give all your brokenness to Jesus this morning. He can set you free. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can even think or imagine. Hallelujah. Friends, this time I'm not losing it. This time I'm not losing it. Now this is the thrust of the message. And then I'm going to send you home. Can I get a witness? Amen. This is the thrust of the message. Dr. Anna spoke about Exodus 34, 1. And I wanted to read this to you one more time. Look with me. What God does with our brokenness in chapter 34, verse 1, the last, the last verse that Dr. Anna spoke about. The Lord said to Moses, I love this. This is God talking to Moses directly. The Lord said to Moses, you chisel out two stones tablets like the first ones. Okay. The first time God did it. The second time you have to partner with God. He said, now you chisel out. You chisel out two stones of tablets this time. How many people know that God's in the chiseling business? Oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. How many people know that, that, that you're under construction right now? Yeah, every one of you are under construction right now. And the Bible continues to state, I will write them the words on the, that were on the first tablet which you broke. Oh, he reminded. He reminded. God reminded Moses, you broke it. Remember that. You broke it. But this time, you're not going to lose it when I give it to you. It's like God is saying, Moses, take responsibility for your actions. Moses, I know you broke the first tablet. I know I was there. I know you got upset. 
I know you let what, what people said and people do hurt you. I know that. I know that, that that was hurting. I know what you saw was hurting. But this time, you're going to have to chisel out the stone like before. This time, you're not going to lose it. It's going to take some work on your part, Moses. I know that you are a shepherd and not a mason working with rocks. I understand that. I understand that cutting out stone isn't your gifting. But this time, we're going to work together. Amen? But once we're done, this is my promise to you, Moses. I will rewrite on those tablets. And this time, you're not going to lose it. Hallelujah. This time, I'm not going to lose it. Wow. This is powerful. What does God do in response to our brokenness? God is going to give back to you all that you lost. That is what Greater Bridgeport, this church is all about. Connecting to the one who can give it back to you. And if you're not coming on Tuesday night prayer, my friends, let me throw a plug in here. Amen. Come to Tuesday night prayer because that's how, amen, you connect. Hallelujah. This is powerful. God didn't change his mind when he called you. No, 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 no. He didn't change his mind. He didn't change his mind when he saved you and when he gave you those gifts and callings. God hasn't changed his mind yet. This doesn't, amen, this doesn't have to happen this way. God is in the God of restoring and bringing back, amen, what the locust has eaten. God is a God of restoration, amen. He's a God that's able, able to do it in your life, able to do it in your marriage, able to do it with your kids. Am I the only one getting excited here this morning, amen? Ha <laughs> ha. This time, I'm not losing it. And God knows you worked hard. Last time, God, you gave it to me. You received it, and it was easy. But this time, you are going to have to chisel it out. This time, you're going to have to cut through some things. Oh, can I talk to some real people here this morning? Amen. Tell them he's talking to me this morning. Who had to cut through some things this morning. You had to cut and chisel through some failures. You had to cut and chisel through some rejection. Oh, come on. You had to cut and chisel through unforgiveness and discouragement. You had to cut through some people, amen, that didn't even like you, hallelujah. Some haters that didn't even like you. You had to cut and chisel through all that. Oh, you had to cut through some stuff. Even through today, you had to cut through some stuff to get here. Maybe before it was easy, but this time it got harder. This time you had to cut through some things. Somebody shout this more morning, this time... Oh, that's weak. Come on. This time, I'm not losing it. Can I get one or two people this morning who was on fire for God, who will stand in agreement with me and Pastor and Magdalia, amen, and the leadership here to shout, this time, I'm not losing it. Oh, look over and tell your neighbor, God is getting ready to flip the script. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. God is getting ready to flip the script. Now touch three people and tell them I feel a turnaround coming. Yeah. I feel a turnaround coming. Yeah. I'm not losing what God gave me. I'm not losing what God gave me. I'm receiving my breakthrough. I'm not losing what God gave me. I'm embracing my call. I'm not losing what God gave me. I'm walking out my destiny. I'm walking out on fire. I'm not losing what God gave me. What he spoke to me. What he wrote to me. What he gave me. I'm not losing it. I'm about to drop this mic. Amen. Yeah. Somebody shout this time I'm not losing it. Yes, I hear you, sister. You see, God has placed me here to remind you that God knows what you saw. God knows what you've heard. But this time, as you work with God and you work to cut through some things, this time you're not going to lose it. Can I get some people here? who have been messed up from the chest up. Can I get a witness, amen? Tore up from the floor up and beat up from the feet up, amen, yeah. To give God some praise like you've never had before. Can I get just two or three people to say, hallelujah. This time, I'm not losing it. You may have lost it before, 
You may have not have known how to handle it before, but this time you have been working with God and you have grown through the process. And this time I'm not losing it. There's no person, there's no place, there's no, no, no situation, there's no man, there's no circumstance, there's no issue, there's no problem, there's no struggle, there's no challenge. No difficulty is going to cause you to lose it anymore because this time I'm not losing it. Hallelujah. Like you did before, this time is different. It's more than just freedom. It's about deliverance. This time, I'm not losing it, losing it. So, ladies and gentlemen, as I close, and I get, can I get the keyboard guy up here? My keyboard friend. Amen. Yeah. Lay, don't lose it, my friend. Amen. <laughs> this time, not losing it. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just tell you this, that what heaven starts, hell cannot stop it. That's worth, that's worth twittering right now. Amen. Yeah. If the sea couldn't stop Moses. And the walls can stop Joshua, and the giant can stop David, and the lion can stop Daniel, and Jezebel can stop Elijah. Can I get a witness? Amen. And if death itself can stop Jesus, nothing on earth or in hell will be able to stop you from living out what God has for your life. Can somebody say amen? So I want you to tell your neighbor, I, I don't want to discourage you. Go ahead, tell him that. Say neighbor, neighbor. Oh, you can do better than that. Come on, want to say neighbor. I don't want to discourage you. But get out of my way. <laughs> it's my turn now. I'm stepping into my miracle. Move out of the way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, yes, yes. Let me say this and then I'm just going to open up these altars because there's many people within the sound of my voice that have lost things. And God wants to restore it back to you. Whether it's your marriage, your kids, they're on drugs, they're doing things, they're going acting crazy. Your, 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 your co-workers trying to take you out of your job. There, there's many multiple things that can be happening right now. But this time you're not going to lose it. This is the last thought I want to share with you. And God is faithful to bring it back to you around. Our God is faithful to bring it back to you around. God isn't bringing it back around for you to repeat the same mistakes. That's not why he does things. He doesn't bring it back around to you so you can make the same mistakes. Amen. God, God, God is bringing it to you. This time it's going to take commitment and change. But one thing for sure, those lost things, God will bring it back. He did it in my own personal life. And as we celebrated 50 years with my parents, I've seen them, God do it in their lives. Amen. God is going to right some wrongs this morning. Put pieces back together. God is going to restore that which is lost in your life. God will rewrite your story. Don't put a, don't put a period, amen, where God has a comma as he's writing your story. And last time, yeah, I understand you dropped it. I understand you lost your faith through the process. I understand that you lost even your identity. You lost yourself through the process. But this time, it's coming back, and it's going to come back strong. And you're not losing it this time. Because when Moses came back down the mountain, amen, and then went back, went through his thing, went through the process, God told him, go back, chisel. Now you chisel out the rock. I bet it looked tore up, the rocks. Nothing like Jesus, amen, like this. Like you see on, on TV, amen, like that. No, it was probably tore up because he was a shepherd. He wasn't a mason. But he had to partner with God. And so he took these plain tablets and he started walking up the mountain again. I can only imagine what he was thinking. God, I know I failed you this time. I know I failed you before. I'm not going to drop what you've given me anymore. He went up to the mountain and God rewrote the very thing with his finger again as he promised and there's many of you today that God is going to rewrite your story with his very finger. Oh, come on. His very finger. You may be feeling depressed or, or even distressed, but God is a God of restoration. And he'll able to meet you right where you're at. Stand with me this morning. Amen.